So what is your uh, impression of Estonia and Estonian sportsmen after those two days here? Wow, big question. Uh, how, I am impressed. It's easy to say to be impressed. I'm impressed, impressed with their willingness to learn. I'm impressed with their willingness to share. I have been challenged by their silence and their wish to get information and want to know how to apply it. Uh, they're friendly. In the equestrian setup which I've met, they're dominated by women. Uh, and they mixed the fun and the serious topics very well. They were, they were good to be with. Okay. Uh, well, the, the second question, obviously, is going to be how did you manage to make those cold and introvert Estonians <laughs> to be so open and, and work with you yesterday's uh, course? Okay, that, that is always a challenge. I, I feel when you're giving a workshop, I like the idea that a workshop is about the other people working when, when you get there. So by planning activities and by bringing the things that are required, Really, when you hand over some responsibility to someone, it's like in athletics, when you hand over a baton, they've got to do something with it. They, they cannot just leave it there. And people, I find, are the same all over the world. That despite what I might be told about this group being difficult or that group being loud, that really when you give them the opportunity to be people, they are, they get stuck in, they roll up the sleeves and, and they'll begin to help each other. You also said yesterday that the country's small size should be our selling point. Yes. How? Yeah. Well, let's look at the, the, the reverse. So sometimes in very, very big areas, it's, it's very difficult to, to get a, a, an identity of place. And we all come from a place. And I, I do believe that everything interesting happens with one person in one place, though the contributions to that one person can be vast. Now, when you get collected a group of people in a fairly small space, <coughs> you maximize the opportunity for that developing. And vastness of size or vastness of numbers can just disconnect from that closeness that all great teams or all great, all great everything have. Estonia, before I came here, I knew you were a technological country, and that's what you're well known for. And I like the phrase that technology makes things easy for us. It can also make, make us lazy. And in the hotel yesterday, now I was able to share that with Stavros, there were 20 Japanese people in the foyer. None of them were talking to each other. They were all on their phone, all. So technology made it easy for them to communicate with somebody who wasn't there. It also prevented them from communicating with the person beside them. So really when people are close to us and we leave her out the technology, we've got to look at them in the eye, we've got to talk to them. And, and that's good. Well, uh, closeness can be sometimes difficult too. In Estonia we have several families that uh, uh, professionally uh, do equestrian sport. What is your suggestion to the next generation or to the kids of famous riders uh, how to step out from the shadow or from the pressure of their famous parents? The first thing that comes to mind, I was in Istanbul recently working with a group of coaches who were involved in endurance sport. And I had them for six days, and the first day they didn't want to speak to, to each other because they saw each other as competitors. So I had to get away from everything equestrian and brought them out, and we started playing games, relay games, chasing games. And it broke a barrier, a perceived barrier that was there, well that's my competitor and that's my friend and this person isn't. Suddenly they got into games. And that was the first phase, I was like growing, growing that relationship. And then we got them back into the classroom and the climate of learning. And again, they were working in small groups that they wouldn't share with the other group. So all these things take time. I'm always struck with trying to develop the individual. So if we tag on to someone that they're the son of or the daughter of, or that they're a native of, we really diminish their own character. Mm -hmm. And I look to see what little strands of character there is in everybody. Because they may be the son of or the daughter of, but they're not, they're not them, they're, they're, they're a different person again. So I would encourage the individuality of, of, of each of them. Just, just disconnect from, from the breathing, if we like. Yeah. Okay, uh, from here arises another question. Why often uh, the riders or whatever sportsmen, after retiring, 
uh, they are not evaluated anymore. In sports, very often, only the winning and being on top level is uh, important. How yeah. to value those riders who have finished their career, but they still yeah. done something very important for the sport? Okay, but there's two things I'd say on that. One, I think on the transition from being a competitor to not being a competitor is a transition that federations and structures and systems need to accommodate because one's self-esteem and one's recognition of themselves as a competitor, when that's taken from them, they are deeply challenged. They really are. Um, so I think there needs to be an empathy and a support there for those people. Now, support people who have a vast experience within it and their role changes. I would say there needs to be education there. And I'm a coach educator and I think they need to be assist, assisted now in not doing writing techniques, but if they want to stay in the sport or be kept in the sport, how can you become a coach? And there are a different set of skills entirely. So it isn't automatic that a rider gets off a horse and suddenly becomes a great coach. I've never sat on a horse and I have made a contribution to riders. Some great riders know very little about coaching. So as well as the transition being a difficult thing for them, if we now put them into a role that they're not trained in, we're really making their, their life difficult. So I would say hold on to the time that people have been involved, but re re retrain them. That takes time, and that takes a bit of effort, and a bit of buy-in by the riders as well. I think in most cases they're very thankful for these things. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Well, we have a very interesting situation in Estonia. Uh, this time in Olympics, the uh, triplets will trio, yeah, trio. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they cannot present us uh, yeah. in uh, Olympic games. What do you think? Uh, is this their strengths that they are siblings, or makes it harder for them? Well, when I saw the video this morning, I think each of them could run a third of the distance, <laughs> and no, <laughs> nobody would know. They run a relay, so keep it quiet at the three. <laughs> I think it's too late for that. <laughs> yeah. Look, I shared yesterday a phrase I heard from a man called Joseph Engloss, and he said about his time in Glasgow that not, not every day easy, not everybody nice. And we talked too about a friendly rivalry. Now, the friendship is, is making things easy and nice. Rivalry is a little bit about competition, about getting outside our comfort zones. And those girls couldn't be where they are without a great support structure, first of all. They didn't have everything comfortable. There were days they ran when they didn't want to run. There were runs I imagine they did that were longer than they wanted to do. I imagine some of them have beaten each other, so there was some some days happy, some days sad. I'd imagine that as parents they may have come home with one of them happy and two of them sad nearly all the time. Yeah. And then the next day a different one is happy and the same too. So the parents had a tough time. So really what I suppose I'm saying is that we have to live in a world where we support people to become uncomfortable. We support people to push themselves to limits that they haven't already got there. And we're there to pick up the pieces irrespective. So but I don't know those. I know they couldn't have got to where they are without a lot of support mm -hmm. and a lot of sweat. Mm -hmm. A lot of sweat, yeah. I've been, I've been looking out for them. But I also hear in the story that there's another lady who has bred tri triplets who's looking to Tokyo and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's something to be yeah. famous of. Yes, I'll keep mm -hmm. an eye out for them. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, I'm going to ask you, what is your favourite sport and what was the last sport you did yourself? Oh, favourite would be hard to answer now, but the one I'm most involved with and the most I most involved was running. I ran everything from 800 on the track to the marathon. And back home in Ireland, I, I am deputy president of schools athletics. I'm the incoming president of the schools international athletics board. That's Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales. And I commentate at road races and that kind of thing. So I suppose I lean towards athletics. I, I like athletics. Um, I like the others too, but athletics is the one that just gets me, gets me inflamed. Yeah. yeah. And what yeah. was the last thing you did? What sport do you do what the, these oh, days? Well, I'm 60 now, but running was the one I did to the most recently. I get up uh -huh. on a stationary bike now in the house, so that my wife and three daughters just can keep away from me. <laughs> but I try to exercise. Unfortunately, miles and miles of running and tarmac, the legs don't attack mm -hmm. the running anymore. But r running would have been the last one. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>